All right, friends, welcome back. So what we want to do now is understand pharmacogenomics and something called enzymatic polymorphisms. And what we're going to do is use Asian flush or the alcohol-induced flush as our example to illustrate how differences in people's genes can cause adverse drug reactions. So the Asian flush is not actually a result of alcohol itself, but it's a result of alcohol metabolism. And we see the process right here. So alcohol actually is eventually metabolized into carbon dioxide and water. But on its way to forming carbon dioxide and water, it forms this intermediate, this toxic intermediate acetaldehyde. And so this bad boy is toxic. And acetaldehyde then is eventually broken down into something called acetate. But if acetaldehyde builds up, if the levels increase, this can cause the Asian flush. And we see the Asian flush right here. So here's a picture of before someone or an Asian person drinks and after an Asian person drinks. And what we see is they've got some redness in their forehead and their face and their cheeks and their neck. They might even have a little bit of itching. Their heart rate sometimes goes up. They might even have some nausea. We get the adverse effects from alcohol. And this is all due to the acetaldehyde. And so our patient here is asking us, hey doc, why is this happening to me but not to my Asian wife? Or why does this happen to some people and not to others? And so to answer his question really gets us into pharmacogenomics. So if I was going to answer his question, what would I say? Well, I would say different people have slightly different genes. And these different genes will code for different enzymes which metabolize drugs, including alcohol. And because the enzymes you have are different than the enzymes your wife has to metabolize alcohol, you are going to get a different response to alcohol. And that is the gist of pharmacogenomics. Now I want to say that pharmacogenomics is really connecting how different genes lead to different drug responses. And it's not just limited to different enzymes. But enzymes and genes coding for them is the most studied component of pharmacogenomics. And our goal is to develop a test to look at people's genes to be able to predict drug responses before they occur. So what we want to do now is look at the enzymes involved in alcohol metabolism. So the first enzyme that is involved is something called alcohol dehydrogenase. And that's abbreviated with ADH, alcohol dehydrogenase. And so what alcohol dehydrogenase is doing is it's taking ethanol, which just looks like that. And you don't have to memorize these structures. And it's a dehydrogenase. So it's stealing a hydrogen, it's oxidizing alcohol, and it's forming acetaldehyde. And we can see that we have this more polar carbon there. And that's what metabolism does. It makes things more polar. And actually, in a previous video, we taught you that alcohol dehydrogenase was a phase one metabolizing enzyme, or this is a phase one reaction. And that's because it's adding or unmasking a polar oxygen group. The second enzyme involved here is acetaldehyde dehydrogenase. And I'm going to write that as ALDH2. And we call this acetaldehyde dehydrogenase 2. And we can see that right here as well. And so this is also a dehydrogenase. It's taking acetaldehyde and it's oxidizing it. And what we're forming is acetic acid. And we know acetic acid. This is what makes vinegar sour. And we can actually use this acetate to um, as an energy source in our body. And so anything that is going to cause the buildup of acetaldehyde is going to cause the toxic effects of alcohol. Now, aldehyde dehydrogenase 2, the reason I say it's a 2 is because the, uh, the aldehyde dehydrogenase is a family of enzymes. And so there's actually a 1, but we don't really care about it right now. But if just a little tidbit, the 2 is a mitochondrial enzyme that's predominant job is to metabolize acetaldehyde. 
The one is a cytosolic enzyme that has other functions. So how does this lead us into pharmacogenomics? Well, population studies have shown that there are two variants of this ALDH2. Two variants. And those variants are related to differences in those patients' genes. Now fortunately, the name of the enzyme, ALDH2, is the same as the name of the gene. And so we have a normal version of the gene, and we have an abnormal version of this gene. And so as scientists, we like to come up with names for things. And so the way that we name the normal variant of ALDH2 is to take a star and put a 1 next to it. So ALDH2 star 1 is the normal variant, and nobody likes to be number 2, so ALDH2 star 2 is the abnormal variant. And the reason I'm giving you this information is, is just so we can talk about it right now. And so these are two different alleles that code for two different enzymes. Now at the genetic level, we call these SNPs, or single nucleotide polymorphisms. I'll just write here, SNPs. At the protein level, or at the enzymes, we call these enzymatic polymorphisms, and we see that up here. So poly, meaning many, many, and morphisms, meaning forms, or shapes, right? Remember, structure determines function. Because we have these different genes, we have a different primary structure between these two, and thus we have a different function. And this is amazing because the only difference in the primary structure between these two is we took a glutamate here and we made that glutamate turn it into a lysine. That's it. One amino acid difference when we look at the primary structure. But the functional difference is huge. So going back to our Asian guy who has this flushing response, well what might have happened is that one of his parents may have had this abnormal ALDH2 star 2 or you know where the glutamate was replaced with a lysine and so when he got that one bad copy of it he now becomes heterozygous and because he is heterozygous and let me just write one bad copy that enzyme or the metabolism of acetaldehyde is going to be 100 times slower. This ALDH2 is going to metabolize acetaldehyde into acetate 100 times slower, and as a result, acetaldehyde is going to build up. Now, if both of his parents had a bad copy here, and he got both of these ALDH2 star 2 genes, from one from his mom and one from his dad, well, then he would be homozygous. And in that case, that enzyme is just non-functional, and even little bits of alcohol cause the flushing, and they cause nausea, and they make people very averse to that alcohol use. So now let's take this new knowledge that you have and show you how you can apply it by looking at a paper. So here's a paper from the Journal of Clinical Toxicology, and it's actually published this year in 2012. And the title of this paper says, The Acute Effects of Ethanol, which is alcohol, and acetaldehyde on physiological responses after ethanol ingestion in young healthy men with different ALDH2 genotypes. So we talked about those two genotypes. One was called STAR1 and one was called STAR2. And so we can see how they did their methods, right? They took 24 men and 12 of them had this genotype. And so it's a STAR1 slash STAR1. So star 1 slash star 1 means they have two good copies, right? That's one for each allele. And then they had 12 men with the ALDH2 star 1 slash star 2 genotype. And so what does that mean? That means that they are, they have one good copy but also one bad copy. They are heterozygous. And as a result, we already can assume what's going to happen. So they do this double-blind, placebo-controlled crossover design, which is a very good study. And what they do is they give them ethanol, alcohol, and the other group has a placebo. 
And what they do is they measure the ethanol concentration, the blood acetaldehyde concentration, and they look at the physiologic responses of facial redness, they look at the pulse rate, and the blood pressure. So we can already, we kind of already know what's going to happen. In this group with the ALDH2, star 1, star 2, the heterozygotes, we know that they're going to have more facial redness than the two good copies. And we know that acetaldehyde is a vasodilator. It causes flushing or increased blood flow to the skin. And a compensatory response, so a vasodilator decreases blood pressure, and a compensatory response is going to be an increase in the pulse rate. And so uh, you can read the results on your own here, but just the conclusion, facial redness and pulse rate after ethanol ingestion were significantly higher in the ALDH2 star 1 star 2 genotype. And this was significantly associated with blood acetaldehyde concentrations. Now here's how this relates clinically. If you're homozygous or you have two bad copies, right, in that, in that study I just showed you, with just one bad copy we're getting the side effects, here you're getting lots of side effects. Side effects. And as a result, these people actually have a decreased uh, chance of alcohol dependence. And the studies have shown that uh, the, the rate of alcohol abuse in people who have this double, uh, two bad copies of the sheen is much lower because they immediately get that flushing, it's embarrassing, and they get a lot more of that side effects. Now for the heterozygotes, we might think that you would get the same thing. But for a lot of these people, they can eventually develop tolerance. And if they continue to drink, right, uh, they can handle the, they won't get as red in the face and whatnot. And so these people actually have these high levels of acetaldehyde because they can drink. And what this does is it increases the risk for cancer. And it increases the risk in particular from that study I showed you in that previous picture. Where was it? In this study, note that what they write here. So the alcohol flushing response, an unrecognized risk factor for esophageal cancer. And so they have an increased risk for, let's just write, cancer. So here's a fact for you. If you're a moderate drinker with flushing, you're at about 10 times the risk of a non-flushing moderate drinker for cancer. And so as a clinician, you need to be conscious of the fact that there are 540 million people who are ALDH deficient, either a heterozygous or homozygous. 540 million. And so it's important to screen your Asian patients who get alcohol-induced flushing and warn them of the increased risk of esophageal cancer. And so the best part here is that we don't need a genetic test to determine if our patients are at increased risk. We can just ask our oriental patients, do you have a tendency to develop facial flushing immediately after drinking a glass of beer? Or if they've developed tolerance, you could say, did you ever get facial flushing, especially within the first one to two years that you started drinking? And if they answer yes, then you can warn them about the increased risk and hopefully get them from being a moderate drinker to a light drinker. So the last point I want to make here is that these are genetic problems that are causing a buildup in acetaldehyde. We can actually take advantage of this though pharmacologically. We actually have a drug, and I just need to mention this now, called disulfiram. And so what disulfiram does is it is a competitive inhibitor of ALDH2 and that causes a buildup of acetaldehyde. Now what in the world would we use this for? Well it's actually used as a alcohol deterrent. So if a patient let's say gets put into rehab and they want to ensure that they don't drink in rehab they have them take disulfiram and whenever they take a sip of alcohol they get the nausea and the 
vomiting and it just makes them very averse to alcohol use. I actually recently had a patient who was out of rehab and was still taking the disulfiram. Now patients hate it and compliance is terrible, but it when they're taking it, it gets them to stop drinking. But data on its long-term effectiveness is really mixed because people just don't like it. So putting everything together, we can see that pharmacologically we can affect the rate of drug metabolism by giving competitive inhibitors like disulfiram, but also there are genetic differences which can cause different drug responses, and that is pharmacogenomics. The idea here is eventually we will develop uh, some sort of genetic test to be able to rule out adverse drug reactions before they happen. And again, you don't have to memorize all of this. The point here is for you to get the bigger picture. So make sure you subscribe to my channel so you can see whenever I post new pharmacology videos. Hope to see you soon.